I have a simplified version of the Rails cast side design, and this design is made up of several images and CSS files. And inside this project, these files are managed using the asset pipeline, as you can see here. Now I do love the asset pipeline, it makes it so convenient to work with SAS and CoffeeScript, but it can sometimes be a pain point, especially in production, and that's what I want to focus on here. Now if you are new to the asset pipeline, first watch episode 279 where I go over the basics. Now the first thing I want to do here is try to run this application under the production environment on my local machine here. This will give us a better understanding of how the asset pipeline works in production. So let's try to serve this Rails application under the production environment using this command. And now when I reload this page, we get an error saying something went wrong. And when I check out the production log, I can see there was a template error and it says application CSS isn't pre-compiled. So production works a little bit differently than development. It doesn't generate the assets dynamically. It expects them to be pre-compiled. Now there is a rake task provided that does this called assets pre-compile. So you'll need to run this first before running the Rails application in production. Now this compiles the assets into the public assets directory and you can see them all listed here. Now each asset has a couple of variations, one with an MD5 digest at the end, another variation is a gzipped version, and I'll explain these and how they work later on in this episode. So with those assets pre-compiled, let's try starting up our server again in the production environment. And try reloading this page again, and we no longer get that 500 error, but the page doesn't look correct. It looks like the assets are not loading properly. And when we check out the log again, this time we get a routing error saying no route matches a path to an asset. So it looks like our Rails application is trying to process that asset path instead of serving up the static file that was pre-compiled. So this is another important distinction between development and production. Now if we check out the middleware in the development environment, uh, you can see that there's this middleware called action dispatch static. And what this does is it serves up static files that are in the public directory. But if we check out the same thing inside of the production environment, you can see that action dispatch static is nowhere to be found here. And that's because for performance reasons, Rails does not handle serving static files in production. It expects that to be handled by the web server, so either Apache or Nginx. Now for more information on rack middleware, check out episode 319. Now if you're just trying out the production environment on your local machine like I'm doing here, you may want to temporarily change this line in your production config file called serve static assets and set that to true. Either do this temporarily or maybe set up a separate environment for doing this like I show in episode 72. And now we can start up our Rails app in production one more time. And this time when I reload the, pray, the page, hey it works, the assets all load properly because it's serving static files. So now that we know how to get production working on our local system, let's see what part the asset pipeline plays in deployment using Capistrano. I'm going to go to my gem file here in this application and uncomment the Capistrano gem. And then I'll run the bundle command to install that gem and capify dot to generate the Capistrano related files. Now this generated a cap file at the root of our project and there's a comment in here saying to uncomment this part if you are using the asset pipeline, and we are. Now I did show this in episode 335, but I want to go into more detail here and show you exactly what this deploy assets file is doing. We can find that file in the Capistrano source code on GitHub. And a handy way to find a file is to type the letter T and then the name. So let's say deploy assets, and there it is. Now nothing too magical is going on inside this file. It's basically just defining a few Capistrano variables and tasks to add the asset pipeline behavior to Capistrano deployment. Now this Rails groups asset setting is kind of interesting. It's basically specifying which gem group to use when compiling the assets. So if you check out the gem file for a project, you can see that option is referencing this assets group. So all these gems will be loaded in when it does the assets precompile task on the production server, because normally these gems are not loaded in in the production environment. Now let's take a look at some of these tasks to find back inside this Capistrano recipe. There's a deploy assets symlink task, which is used internally. And this automatically happens before the finalized update process of the Capistrano deployment. And you notice that this basically symlinks the shared assets path to the public assets path on each release. 
So all of the assets will actually be stored under the shared directory in the server. Now this next task is called precompile. And this will trigger the assets precompile rake task that I ran earlier on my local to prepare the assets for production. And this task will be run automatically as well during the deployment process. So you basically don't have to think about preparing the server for the asset pipeline. It'll just happen automatically when you deploy. And there's just one more task to find in this file called clean. And this just removes the assets and it doesn't happen automatically. So you would just trigger this uh, command manually if you want it to run. All right, now that we know what's going on behind the scenes, let's try deploying this application. Now off camera, I've already set up a server and prepared this app for deployment. You can watch episodes 335 and 337 for more information on that. Now I've done everything up to the point of running cap deploy cold. So let's run this command to deploy this application. So what this command will do is check out our application from the Git repository and uh, run bundle install to install any gems and then run the migrations and then run that rake assets precompile task to compile any assets. And uh-oh, it looks like we got a failure here. It says it failed to run the assets precompile task. And if we look up here, we can see the error message could not find a JavaScript runtime. Now, some of the assets such as CoffeeScript require JavaScript to compile, but a bare Ubuntu setup like I have here does not include a JavaScript runtime by default. So we have to install one. Now, normally when I set up a server, I install Node.js to fix this problem but I purposefully left that step out here so that you could see what this error message looks like. Now I do recommend installing Node.js on the server like I show in episode 335, but if that isn't an option, another way to solve this is to add this gem called the Ruby Racer. So we can just uncomment it here in the gem file and then run the bundle command to install it. And then I'll commit that to our Git repository saying adding the Ruby Racer and then uh, push this up to GitHub. So now we can try running cap deploy cold again and see if it works this time. And I don't see any failures, so it looks like it worked. Yay, let's check it out in the browser. So I'll try pointing our browser to our VPS IP address and it works. All of our assets are being loaded properly. Now, if we check out the network activity for this page, we can see all of the requests to the assets that were made. And notice each of these assets has the digest at the end of the file name. So this is a unique fingerprint based off of the contents of this file, which means if the file itself changes, the name will change as well. So we can cache this file like crazy. Now here's what my Nginx server configuration looks like. And I want you to focus on this section right here, which applies to everything under the assets directory. One option that's specified here is expires and that's set to max, which basically means to hold on to its HTTP cache of this file as long as possible. And you can see that if you check out the headers for one of these uh, asset requests, uh, you can see that the max age is set to a very high number. So this will stick around as a cache inside of the browser. Now this makes the site feel very fast when all these assets are served through the browser's cache. But this wouldn't be possible without the digest in the name like this because then the browser wouldn't know when the file changed so it wouldn't know when to update the cache. Here the file name itself will change so of course it will fetch the file from the server. Now, if you want more information on HTTP caching, check out episode 321. Now, one side effect of that digest behavior is that you must always use helper methods when referencing an asset. For example, use image tag to add an image instead of a static path. And in your SAS files, you can use this image URL function to reference an image and that will add the digest properly to it. Now, not only does the asset pipeline help with caching, it also tries to make the content of the asset as small as possible. You can see this JavaScript here is minimized to reduce the file size. In addition to this, a version is generated using gzip compression, and we take advantage of this inside of our Nginx config by setting gzip static to on. So this means uh, Nginx will look for a gzip version and send that to the user where applicable. Now, if you're ever unsure if gzip is working, check out this HTTP compression test, which I'll link to in the show notes. All you have to do is pass in the URL to an asset and click test. And this here says it is gzipped and it tells us our data savings here as well. Awesome. I hope this gives you a better understanding of why the asset pipeline works the way it does. It may seem like it's jumping through a lot of hoops here, but if it's a better and faster experience for the user, it's all worth it. Now the default asset pipeline behavior is quite nice and I recommend trying to stick to that if you can. 
However, it doesn't fit everyone's needs, and it's also quite customizable, as you can see in the production configuration file. For example, you could choose to turn off JavaScript and CSS compression by turning, setting this to false. Uh, you may want to do this for debugging purposes, maybe in some kind of staging environment. Now another option is you can enable asset compiling by setting this to true. Now you may want to do this if you don't want to pre-compile the assets, but instead compile the assets on the fly as requests are made to them. Now if you make this change, you'll also need to make a change inside of your application.rb file because by default the assets group gems will not be loaded in production. You'll need to comment out this line and uncomment this line if you want to do lazy compiled assets in production. Also, if you make this change, you'll probably want to comment out that load assets file in your cap file so that assets aren't precompiled when you deploy. So this compile option is useful if you don't want to precompile the assets, but I don't really recommend it. It's going to have to load all the asset-related gems in every Rails instance and compile them there. So this means it'll use up more memory, which can be avoided with a simple precompile. Now, if your issue with precompiling is that it's taking a long time for you, you may want to add this configuration option called initialize on precompile and set that to false. This basically means it will not load the entire Rails application when it's doing a simple precompile. But this won't work in some cases, such as on a Heroku deploy. And finally, there's an option to turn the digest feature off if you don't want that added to the end of each file name. Now just be aware that if you do remove the digest, you should also remove the expires max setting in your web server so that it doesn't stick around in the HTTP cache. So you lose those caching benefits without the digest. Now while I'm here inside of the production configuration file, I also want to mention that you should uncomment the send file header option for the web server that you're using, in my case Nginx. So this way, if the Rails app does send a file back, it will use the web server. Now there's one more asset pipeline variation that I want to talk about, and this has to do with the Capistrano precompile task that I showed you earlier. Now if you have trouble compiling the assets on the server, then you can't very well run the assets precompile task on the server. So instead you can run assets precompile on your local machine and then upload those assets to the server. So here are the steps to do this. First, go into your .gitignore file and add the public assets directory into there. So this way, the compiled assets won't be added to Git. While you could use Git to sync these assets, I prefer to use rsync because I think putting them inside a Git repository gets pretty messy. And then next, go into your cap file and make sure the deploy assets line is uncommented because we still want to use the other tasks that this provides. And then finally, at the bottom of your deploy.rb file, paste in this task which overrides the deploy assets precompile task to run bundle exec assets precompile on your local system and then it runs the rsync command to sync that public assets directory up to the server for each of the servers that match uh, the web role. So with those settings in place, now when we run cap deploy, it's going to compile the assets on our local machine and then rsync those up to the server. So with this setup, the asset pipeline still works great and our server doesn't have to precompile the assets. It's all done on our local machine. Well, that's it for this episode on using the asset pipeline in production. Thanks for watching.